Hi, and welcome to another Entrepreneur Stories. I'm Afonso from Bundle, but these stories are not about me. They're not about Bundle. They're actually about entrepreneurs. This is where we can learn from entrepreneurs who have made it. They have built businesses from within. They have learned and they have the challenges, the difficulties, and they have tips and tricks that they can share with us today. I actually have an amazing guest with me on my laptop in front of me and on the screen there. So I might switch my eyes up and down. But before I introduce my guest, I would really like to read a quote from his latest book, The Entrepreneur. But what if we as individuals had the power to change the world of business? We are in the age of the entrepreneur, where mavericks and rebels bring their entrepreneurial prowess to big business. The change is from the inside out and from the bottom up. Gib Bullock, you are an author, a writer. You are also the founder of Accenture Development Partnership, where you began your track record as an entrepreneur. And I'm honored to be speaking to the author of The Entrepreneur, Confessions of a Corporate Insurgent. Thank you, Gib, for accepting to be here with us today. It's a great pleasure, Alfonso, and I'm delighted to speak to you uh, with that uh, rather uh, team title there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, there's so much to cover here today. So I believe your career of entrepreneurship spans something between 10 to 16 years. Um, and if I understand correctly, you were um, at Accenture, one of the biggest businesses and consultancy in the world. Um, and one day you felt something was missing and you felt a calling. Was that the moment you came in touch with entrepreneurship? Uh, no, it wasn't actually. Uh, well, not the moment that I came in touch with uh, what I became to understand as entrepreneurship. It was probably the moment when I started on my journey. So uh, if we put the kind of labels to one side for a moment, I was in London working in, you could say, the rat race. I had followed the path that I was told to follow. You know, you work hard, you try and get a job, you're chasing a good salary, you're all the KPIs of what we would normally describe as success was tend to ticking, ticking them, you know, including a nice fast sports car, all these things. But why, why was I not ultimately fulfilled? I was enjoying life, but something was missing as you, as you put it. And that was the moment, well, something came to me. I, I think uh, it was the notion that I could um, use business and my business skills in a different way. I saw an advert for the need for business skills in developing countries. It was an NGO, a charity that was providing volunteers. They didn't want, or they had enough of your traditional volunteers that go to developing countries. They didn't have enough business people with management skills or strategy skills and all the kind of things that I had. And so long story short, I found myself in the Balkans just after the Kosovo war, working as a volunteer, finding a role for my skills that was about purpose and, and impact and um, earning 90% less money, but more motivated than I'd ever been. So th that's when I, became an addict, a drug addict, as I describe in the book. It was a, a the drug was purpose and, and I was, you know, I was gone. It, that was the, the catalyst. That was the crucible moment. And I think there are these moments in life that many of us will have when something changes and they don't have to be, you know, the big, very big set piece events of, you know, someone dies, someone's born, you get married, you lose your job. It, it may be, but in my experience, it was trivial. I was on the Metro in London, reading a paper and an article jumped out at me. And that was the trigger that the response was an email that led to a meeting that led to a year volunteering. That then year was fermenting in my head the fact that actually the career and the trajectory I was on was not the path that I felt was the right one for me. And in these cold winter nights in Macedonia, um, or Northern Macedonia, I think we have to call it now, since the, the new ruling um, with Greece. Um, that was the moment where I was thinking, how could we turn the business model of consulting on its head and use the kind of expertise and the innovation and the technology and the strategy skills and provide them in parts of the world where there's a great need for these skills, but traditionally least access. And the idea I came back with was to create a, a, a social enterprise, a, a within the corporation. I could have left and tried to go out and do some good and start a nice little entrepreneurial business. I quite consciously and deliberately stayed within the business because I felt that 
um, it was a better route to scale, to try and incubate this thing and have access to Accenture's consultants who would work on half their salary, that the company would agree to forgo profit on the work that we would do, let's say, with NGOs and other organisations, and that these NGOs and organisations wouldn't receive free skills, they would buy our services. And my job was to make that equation break even. So I prefer to call us a not-for-loss business as opposed to a not-for-profit. We were actually both. And we got going for several years, and, and this is, I suppose, the punchline or the answer to your question. It was five or six years into following this path, growing a business within a business, um, doing what I thought was the right thing to do, and having some impact. And yes, the people came. They did half their salaries, even though people said that I was nuts to, to think about it. Yes, NGOs did cut a check to Accenture, even though people said, you're out of your mind if you think, say, the Children Oxfam World Vision will buy services. They did, because the, the, fee, the fees they were paying were 20 cents in the dollar. And it was five or six years into that that I got a phone call from someone called Maggie Dupre saying, um, I'm doing a study on entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship in business. Um, we think you're one of these people, and I'd never heard of the term. Uh, and again, I come back to this point that the label doesn't really matter. It's not any job title. You don't see it on business cards. It's not a LinkedIn profile. It's a mindset and a skill set and a behavior that is about being willing to step away from the herd and do something that is um, has meaning to you and that you believe is the right thing rather than what, let's say, the system is telling you you should be doing. So from... The outset and what you were able to build um, in Accenture is humongous. But how difficult was it for you as an uphill battle? How difficult was it to get hand raisers to join the cause and saying, I actually have a different project, which I'm trying to build. And you had five years of it when you, before you were um, called by Maggie, you say. Um, how difficult was it for you? So one of the... the, the benefits of now being outside the system. I left Accenture just over two years ago is that I can speak. There's no filters coming through in terms of what I'm going to tell you today. Um, only what I choose to, to filter myself. I'm not going through any comms thing. So I can tell you quite honestly that I got great support within the, the firm. Um, certainly initially, a lot of leadership got behind the idea. Um, Backed us, formed a little board, we got the thing going. It was fabulous support to, you know, they bought into the idea. And your question, was it difficult to get people to, to join the team? Absolutely not. Um, this thing was like a lightning rod. We put out the concept that actually you can have a career, almost like a hybrid career, where you can um, be working in a large organization, a large consultancy, be paid well, have all the terms and conditions and pension coming down the line. But every other year you can go and use what skills you might have been working with Unilever on, you might be able to apply to UNICEF. You're a supply chain person, you can look at last mile logistics uh, when it comes to medicines or health. You're a technology person, you can revamp the systems and processes of an NGO. Your work can change lives quite dramatically. And that purpose thing is something that today, 2018, is stronger now, I think, than ever before. People are yearning. The millennials, I think, much younger than me, are yearning for purpose. So we can come back for that. But the answer to your question was this was a lightning rod for, frankly, the brightest and best people. We were getting people who were at the top levels of their performance as far as the corporate um, evaluations were concerned and that wanted to be drawn to this thing. Um, so I didn't have to build a team that built itself. It, it, it's true. And, and just if I, if, I, if I may add, I did a study um, two years ago with uh, EY, the Beacon Institute, and Deloitte, and LinkedIn. And I was doing the LinkedIn part. And um, in, ter in, terms of, uh, in terms of purpose. And we found that what actually combines millennials and baby boomers is understanding that social entrepreneurship is not a CSR initiative. Oh, God, but, CSR is the enemy of it. It fucking kills um, entrepreneurship. But, but it's quite funny because baby boomers will never double their salary because they're very happy. <laughs> and millennials will never earn what baby boomers earn. So they both see purpose being a very important component of their career and their job. And, and so it sounds to me that, A, you had a conscious effort 
of doing this with the synergies and leveraging everything you had inside Accenture. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have a calling to become an entrepreneur. You were gladly an entrepreneur, if I understand correctly. And you were able to see that social entrepreneurship was adding value to the business. Absolutely. And the only reason that the, well, I guess I need to ask them this directly, but let's say I'm firmly of the belief that the reason I got support and the, and the, and the reason any entrepreneur, let's just call it entrepreneur, social or otherwise, will get support is, is because there is a firm business case behind what you're doing. If you try and go with a nice idea that is pleading and, and pulling on the heartstrings of senior business leaders, I don't think you will get very far. I don't think that is a rational business argument. We were saying here is an initiative that is really very much around having an impact, yes, in parts of the world in, in, that we don't currently work in and with organizations that we don't currently work with. But by doing this, we will attract, retain and develop the talent that we need for tomorrow. And we did some analysis in the feasibility study stage back in 2002 that showed there was a strong correlation between employee performance and levels of interest. The bell curve was skewed disproportionately towards our brightest and best people, the people Accenture wanted to, to bring into the firm and retain. So that was the business case. It evolved over time, especially as we started increasingly to work not just with NGOs, but in collaboration with our commercial clients. But it was very much based on that fact that there is something good for the employee, there's something good for the company, and by the way, it's something that's good for the world as well. And, and, and Gabe, you touch upon so importantly on having this business case to get management and stakeholder buy-in. Mm -hmm. In your view, as an entrepreneur, social or otherwise, does that business case need to have the same KPIs as the company, the mothership itself? Or should we always apply different KPIs to the business case when we're talking about a venture of any sort? It will be an overlap of, of, of the two. Uh, and and it will depend very much on the on the on the, the venture. I if the screen could go across to the far wall, you can't quite see it, but there is a framed um, picture which is one of my uh, monthly report cards as a partner within uh, Accenture. And I and I frame it not because it's so good, but because it's so bad. Um, it was rows and rows and rows of zeros. You know, so all the traditional metrics that we tend to drive and guide our business decisions. In this context, we're all zeros. And I found it quite um, amusing that I was still seeming to be employed by this company despite getting this row of zeros in my monthly report card. Of course, I had another set of metrics uh, that I was held accountable to. I did have a P&L. I was trying to make the business cost neutral, but it was things around employee engagement and retention and numbers of people and um, brand impact and things like that. And, and, and give another thing you say, which I, I, I read and I love is, be the change you want to be in your company. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you were able to achieve so much with Accenture and it worked to the advantage of founding the, um, the development partnership. However, where do you believe entrepreneurs in a general sense may come across corporate and the mothership being a disadvantage or a hurdle at times? Um, where uh, and when? Every day and in many, many different areas. So yes, there was support, especially in the early stages. Um, but of course, over time, people come and people go within large organizations. Senior leaders retire. Uh, some people lose their jobs. So you find yourself, or I found myself, reselling um, the business case, the rationale, four years in, eight years in, 12 years in again, it became quite difficult. And in fact, ironically, towards the end um, of my time in the firm, the more I saw the potential to really go to the next level, I found myself, again, having to resell where we were rather than uh, where we were going to. And, and the notion I talk in one chapter is called this in the book, the corporate immune system. Um, I believe that every corporation has these and unleashes consciously or unconsciously these antibodies of controls, of culture, of attitudes, of KPIs, of hurdle rates. Middle management enforcing policy, um, following their annual objectives, 
will kill entrepreneurship dead in the water. And that was the struggle, that was the fight every day. Um, policies that are wanting to take a company on this direction will be irrelevant for an organization or an innovation that's trying to go in this direction. So how do you resist the immune system? How do you fight off the antibodies? How do you stay resilient? And are these qualities that you believe every entrepreneur should have? Resilience, perseverance? Um... Oh, there's many qualities that entrepreneurs should have. Some of them would be good qualities and some of them you would probably consider quite bad. Stubbornness, pain in the uh, ass, um, uh, don't take no for an answer, um, determined. But yes, resilient, visionary, um, you know, be, you have to communicate your, your ideas. So it's, we're all a mixture of of good and bad things and, and interesting mixes. But if you're a, this is not for the shy and the faint hearted. Uh, that's what I would definitely say. Uh, if you're timid, if you want an easy life, just follow the flow, um, take the paycheck, carry on and you'll have a nice career. If you want an interesting life and a fulfilling life, then you probably have to go on this uh, uncharted bumpy road um, of being a pain in the ass entrepreneur. And that's quite funny because the title of your book is Confessions of a corporate insurgent, insurgent, the word being against the grain. Do you believe entrepreneurship goes against the grain or is there or is just the friction of something new, which people might not understand? Again, the labels, I, the labels are there to try and be a little bit dramatic and, and sell the book and, and, and meet people that you call me up to to have a chat. Um, <laughs> it, it works very well. Think, there you go. There is something about um, having to go a bit against the grain. I firmly believe that the current trajectory that business is on and this somewhat myopic OCD, you could say, focus on uh, short-term profit maximization, that is the, the, the direction of most companies, as opposed to profit and, and shareholder value and societal value being an outcome of following a purpose. If you're going to challenge the norm, then obviously, then yes, it will be a little bit going up against the grain. I think the trick is where you can try and find that symbiosis between the interests of the company, the interests of the investors in the company and the leadership of the company and society. And, and that's the big message towards the end of the book, which is very much about, re, about really confronting this, this paradox, this, this dichotomy in business that still exists, where we believe there is the business over here um, and that's all about one set of metrics. And over here, it's where we do good. And this is the CSR or the foundation or the do-goody people in business. And we have to do enough of this to legitimize this. Whereas, of course, these things should be convergent. And I believe that the, when business wakes up to the inherent value that there will be in solving society's problems, innovating around how we feed the next billion on the planet, how we educate them, provide access to clean water, energy, uh, healthcare, you name it. For me, these are business opportunities in disguise. They are not the domain of the CSR department. They are the domain of business strategy. Companies like Unilever from the top down are waking up to that, but there aren't enough of them. And is that where perhaps, you know, business obsessions come in and, and good business obsessions today where we're fighting gender parity, we're fighting diversity, is that where you believe there could be more obsessions coming in that can just make business better, that make business a force for good, that make corporate environments more diverse and stronger to have more of these ideas and innovative processes for the future? So I'm you know, a huge believer in diversity in business. It was something Accenture took very, very seriously. Um, but at the moment, diversity seems to be constrained to your gender, the color of your skin, your sexual orientation. And yes, if we are inclusive, we get the, 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 the best of all worlds if we include, if we're inclusive. It doesn't tend to be diversity of how we think and embracing people who think differently and might act differently in business. And for me, that's something that's missing from today's uh, diversity agenda. And that's where companies, I think, are missing a trick on innovation. I wrote a blog recently uh, in, the, in the Scotsman, maybe you, you can send it out as a link with the, with the interview, but it was really asking the question of businesses, you know, if, you, if Elon Musk's resume came across your desk and you're hiring in a business, or Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos or whoever, would you hire them? Of course, you'd be crazy not to. 
My contention is that there are plenty of bee sauces in musks in, in your business already, but, or, or they've already left because you haven't created the enabling environment to allow them to flourish, to allow these entrepreneurs inside to create the business value that you need because they're difficult to work with. They're probably difficult to manage and I bet it would be an absolute pain in the ass to have inside the company. But look at the value that they're creating both for investors as well as for the society around about them. This is great. And, and Gib, I got to just, I got to lay down a question that came from our previous interviewee and it brings it back a little bit to business. Um, this question comes from uh, um, Isabel uh, Val, which you'll see um, on the other videos. And she was talking about, she built in a B2B brand, a B2C brand. And her question is, when you go from being a small startup and you start scaling up and gaining importance and traction in the markets where you're performing, when do you ask for money? How difficult is it? Do you have that experience as an entrepreneur where you need to go up to senior execs and having to ask them, I need investment for X, Y, Z. And when, when should you do it? As early as possible? Should you do it um, when you find the need? What do you believe would be the right method? Um, again, every, every um, example will be, will be different. But in my own experience, I was asking for money all the time or investment all the time. Um, because we were trying to, to, to grow. I mean, look at the companies like, um, take Amazon, for example, look at its return to investors. It's minuscule, it's, pro it's actual profit and dividends are tiny because it's re in reinvesting it all in. So we were growing massively, um, having, I would say, massive benefit both on the company and others. I mean, in our first 10 years, I, it was a fraction of what I thought we could achieve, but we probably provided about a quarter of a billion worth of services in 80 countries involving thousands of Accenture staff. It's not bad, I suppose, from a standing start, but that was a, we were hungry for more investment. And as we got bigger, what we, I think the key answer, the key, key thing I would stress in this answer is that we needed a longer runway of investment than the short you know, we need this for the next quarter, we need this for the next quarter. What we needed and didn't, I wasn't successful in obtaining, let's say, was a three years worth to say, actually, if we want to go to our full potential, we will probably have to dip and, 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 and go smaller or, you know, reduce or, or, or not achieve all the targets we want in order to go through an inflection point and go up. And we will need to have a clear runway of two, three years worth of investment. And I found myself having to beg, steal and, and borrow um, on a kind of quarterly by quarterly, annual by annual basis. And I think that's a challenge is, is when you go from asking for the small amounts, which is continual, to saying, okay, if we want to move the dials on this, we really need to um, get a proper long term investment. I see. And Gib, I only have two more questions for you. Um, I love everything I'm learning and I just want to know, would you do it again? In a heartbeat, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but um, that is not to say that I'm going to um, jump in, having left one consultancy, I would go and, and do, um, um, do the same in another big consultancy, try and do ADP2 inside another consultancy. The thing was right for me at the time and I had an absolute blast. The company was supportive, uh, mostly. Did I get everything I wanted? No, um, but that's life. My point is, would I follow my heart rather than my head? Would I go with my intuition and step across that threshold of fear, if you will, into the unknown because I thought it was the right thing to do rather than what was my, on my performance objectives? The answer to that is absolutely. And that would be what I would recommend to other people in their own context. That's a very strong motivator. Last question, Gib. Um, I'm going to be doing another interview uh, next Monday, and I'd love to know what question can I, you leave me to ask the next interviewee? <laughs> I didn't know that question was coming. <laughs> There's always an Easter egg to everything. There's a little surprise. Uh, a little surprise. I like the question when did you last change your mind or, 
on something or what did you last change your mind about? Ask them that and you'll get a little bit of a measure for the person you're speaking to. Fantastic. That's a great question. And um, I hope we get, I'm sure we'll get a great answer. Please don't ask it of me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, we might come back to you, Gib, because the reality is I have your book coming in the post and I have snippets of it, but there's a lot more that I want to learn. There's a lot more about your journey. And I can only thank you um, on behalf of, well, especially me, but Bundle and all entrepreneurs out there who are considering, I want to start my next venture. What challenges may I face? Um, There's so much you've left us here to learn. And I want to thank you for your time today, uh, calling in from beautiful and sunny summer Geneva. It's my pleasure. And I hope once you've read the book that uh, this interview goes out, (laughs) you might change your mind. But anyway, it's been great talking to you all. It it will come out. Thank you so much, Gib. Um, And we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. There you have it, Gib Bullock. And final message, I would do it again in a heartbeat. A lot of things to take care of. The first one is, this is on YouTube and the Bundle Tube channel. However, if you're on the go, we do have this in podcast form and you can find it on any podcast platform today. If you want to leave questions, please do leave comments, questions. We will answer it as bundle. We will also get your questions to the entrepreneur. You can also leave voice messages on Anchor if that's just easier for you. Last ask from me. Are you an entrepreneur? Do you have a story of a venture you've built from within? Share it with us. We'd love to speak to you. My email's in the bottom. Please get in touch and I'll see you in a couple of weeks.